thanks for joining. We're really excited to have Nicholas Sauvage here with us. He's going to be giving a presentation on corporate venture capital and more specifically what CVC is and the story of how he founded TDK Ventures. Um, Nicholas is the managing director of TDK Ventures, which is the corporate venture capital arm of Japanese electronics manufacturer TDK Corporation, which is based in San Jose, California. Uh, he started TDK um, back in, he started TDK in 2019 to invest in and serve early stage innovative startups to bolster innovations in digital transformation and energy and environmental transformation that will improve and sometimes save people's lives. Uh, prior to TDK, Nicholas was responsible for all strategic ecosystem relationships at Invincence, including Google and Qualcomm and other system companies. And before that, he was part of NXP software management team, responsible for worldwide sales and later PL and product management of the OEM business line. Uh, he's an alumnus of Stanford, INSEAD, and the Higher Institute for Electronics and Digital Training in France, as well as the London Business School. Um, so with that, Nicholas, I will hand it over to you. Again, really excited to have you here with us. Um, and just a reminder to everyone on the call, um, please do remember to keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation and put any questions you have for Nicholas in the chat and we can um, get to those throughout the presentation or at the end, really whatever you prefer, Nicholas. Very nice. Thank you, Richard. It's very nice to be here with you guys today. And I'm impressed you, you said my name with a French accent. Really nice. <laughs> so yes, today I'm going to talk about corporate venturing. Um, I, I have um, about 24 slides. I think it will take about 25 minutes to go through. Uh, if you have questions during and I can manage to see the pop, I'm happy to answer. But uh, we, I, I left so much time for Q&A that we can go back in, in different slides. So don't hesitate to mark your questions or to ask them. With that, I will start the um, presentation. All right. You see it full screen? Mm-hmm. All right, very good. So very quickly, TDK. Uh, I don't know if all of you know TDK. Um, if you're below 35 years old, it's not obvious. If you are above 35 years old, you will remember the tape and the cassette. Um, what's nice to know, and this slide is really nice to show, is that it's a company that keeps growing, but uh, across multiple pivots. And so you can see that some business went really nicely up and then went to zero. Um, and what that is really uh, important for us is to say we understand startups, we understand the challenges of startups, of entrepreneurs, and the need to do pivots and to go into new technology and new market. We also are very committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And everything we do, whether it's an investment in product or an investment in startup, has to go through the filters of these SDGs. So TDK Ventures, who are we? We are based in San Jose, like Rachel mentioned. We have a first fund of $50 million. We invest in early stage projects all around the world. So we've done investments in the US, Israel, Germany, China, and we will continue to do so. And we really look at leveraging fundamental material science to unlock an attractive and a sustainable future for the world. Uh, what's really nice is recently, so about two months ago, we've been awarded uh, the, the um, highest reward, uh, sorry, award uh, in the corporate venturing um, uh, ecosystem, which is the Power List 100, which is basically awarding the top 100 corporate ventures out of more than 2,400, so the top 5%. So this is really uh, nice because it shows that what we are doing at TDK Ventures uh, is recognized by the ecosystem as best practices and contributing to the ecosystem. I want to very quickly go about what's the difference between a corporate VC or CVC and the financial VCs, which I understand you are all interested to be a part of or joining or already joined, uh, which I would call just VC. Uh, 
really, if you think about it, the CVC, the only difference is about the limited partners. Uh, normally, most CVCs have a single LP, which is a mother company. So in our case, our CVC fund, fund number one, but in the future, fund number two, will be 100% um, funded by TDK versus a financial VC that have a number of LPs with very different motivations, but always a financial motivation. And that leads me to the biggest misconception, and I'm going to answer how it is a misconception, but most people when, when asking about the goal of a corporate VC, believe that it's a, a spectrum uh, between being financial and being strategic. And of course, I'm kind of telling you already it's a misconception because this is the wrong way to think about it. So let me then tell you a bit about the story about TDK Ventures. I proposed this project back in 2018, just after I finished my program at Stanford, uh, Stanford Executive Program. And during this program, I realized that TDK needed a corporate VC. And the reason is, TDK is very good at exploitation. And exploitation, the best way to look at it is you're in a mountain. It's a very tall mountain. Your company wants to go to the top of that mountain, but you have competitors on the same mountain too, trying to do the same. And exploitation is for you to be at the top, getting to the top. And that could be revenue, that could be profit, that could be customer delight, that could be contribution to society. You name what you mean by the top of the mountain, but your job is to get to the top and to be better than any of your competitors. Exploration on the other side is you are this little helicopter flying away from this mountain where your mothership, uh, your mother company is and trying to discover new peaks. And it's probably very cloudy, so you're not sure the mountains you are landing on are tall or not tall. Maybe they're even taller than where your mother company is and maybe they're not. And maybe it's a great mountain with a lot of flat areas and you can have, build a really nice ecosystem or a market, or maybe it's a terrible mountain and you don't know until you land and you discover it. And the um, reasons why we decided to do TDK Ventures is to do these explorations into new markets where we are not in today, but we want to get to uh, with technology we don't have. And you could argue that this is the same as corporate development. You could do that with corporate development, with M&A. And, and here, what I'm going to describe afterwards is not necessarily. M&A is actually very committing. It means you already know you want to go there and you're going to spend a lot of money to acquire a company. While you're a corporate VC, you invest in startups, which you may not even want to invest in, the, uh, sorry, you may not want to buy these companies in the future, but you want to learn from the ecosystem. So if I want to explain the difference between corporate development and corporate VC, uh, they are both outside in. So it's about getting a lot of information from the outside ecosystem and bringing these learnings inside uh, the mothership. And they both reinforce each other. And this is what I want to show here is actually the way I see the overlap and also the differences. One is about the link to the short-term company's needs, the business group or the business company or the business lines. And corporate development has to be quite tied to it. It's about um, how do you improve the exploitation, getting to the top of the mountain. Uh, but also the investment objective is inorganic growth. You're looking at acquiring companies. Well, if you think about corporate VC in the exploration goal that I just described, you're trying to be quite loose from this uh, business goals. You're trying to go further from that. You're not looking at the short term, next one or two years. And also your goal is not inorganic growth, it's actually learning. You want to learn about these new peaks. Are they good for TDK, my mother com company or not? And then if you think back about these mountains, corporate development is really about the exploitation, getting to the top of this mountain versus corporate VC, which is this exploration. And here the mission is capturing actionable learning. Is there a question? Okay. I think somebody wanted to talk to you for a second. Okay, no problem. So, of course, there is a lot of reinforcement and, and help between the two teams. Uh, so, for example, corporate development can send us ad hoc investment opportunities they are looking at, 
and they want us to help with the due diligence. But the most important part is actually what we can bring back in terms of actionable learnings, which means we can help our company to decide more informed m and more informed R&D investments. And I'm spending time on this slide because as all of you are going to join financial VCs, you're going to find it very, very important to be able to partner with corporate VCs. And you need to understand the way they are thinking. What is their goals? What are they motivated by? That's very, very important because uh, I would say 10 to 15 years ago, corporate VC probably had a bad reputation. They didn't know how to invest or how to commit and how to follow investments and so on. I think recently the corporate VCs are doing a much better job, but actually they are bringing a lot more value to the startup they invest in. And so potentially when you think about investing in a startup from a financial VC, it's always good to have a good syndicate. But in your syndicate, if you bring a corporate VC that is going to help the startup to de-risk, to accelerate their success or reduce the risk along the way, that makes your investment even more likely to succeed. So your beta, the risk is going to reduce. And so I'm spending time to explain the why of a corporate VC so that you have a feel about how to engage with them, what motivates them. So very quickly, TDK Ventures, we've been, we started in July, 2019. Uh, we've made 12 investments so far, two we haven't announced. And you can see it's quite diverse, but it's all about areas which are important for my mother company to learn. So we want to learn about robots. So we invested in Agility, which is a really cool company, all about very low power robots that can do what a, ma uh, a human shaped person can do. Uh, Starship, which is all about delivering uh, food in campuses or cities. Uh, for example, if you're a single parent in the UK, uh, and you need to buy something with the groceries, you don't need to have something very disruptive to take the kids, go to the supermarket, you can have it bring it to you. Uh, we also invested in healthcare. So Genetesis is about detecting whether you're going to have uh, an issue with your heart after you had a, uh, a heart incident, or if you can go home safely, and so on. And if you think about all these investments, they fit what I mentioned earlier, which is it's an exploration mission for us. It means we are looking at going into markets we are not in today, but we want to go into, and with technology we don't have today. But we want to get to understand this technology and decide if we want to invest in them. And so if you think about this picture, you can see this very happy guy surfing the wave. And that's what I care as a business unit, is the guys who are thinking about the next 12 months and how to make a good business. And he's very, very happy. But what he's not realizing is that it doesn't have a full visibility of the wave. And so most companies would have corporate R&D and M&A who are looking further away. So maybe in the technology they don't have or markets they are not in. A corporate DC with an exploration mission is actually looking at markets we are not in with technology we don't have. So it's much further. And the idea is that we are going to be disrupted. There's no doubt about it. Someone is going to find a way to disrupt us. And the corporate VC with an exploration mission is about discovering these disruptions and embrace them. Try to understand how we can capitalize on this, uh, on this next, <clears throat> next disruptions. So let's go back to this biggest misconception, which is corporate VCs have to be uh, along a spectrum of financial and strategic. And many, many times uh, I see a lot of surveys where I'm being asked, are we strategic, are we financial, let's go to one to 10. And I'm like, it's completely the wrong question. And let me tell you how we decide to invest. Uh, so the way we invest is we look at three very important criteria, financial returns, strategic value, and a sustainable future. And we only invest when we have the overlap of the street. So it has to be really good financial returns potential. It has to be really good strategic value. It has to be something really good for the future of our planet. And once we have that, we invest. But if we only have two out of three, we don't. And so I'm going to go into step one, two, and three, but you can see that step one and step two is the same as financial VCs who have impact goals double line or triple line, how it's called. So the point is number one and number two is the same as a financial VC. 
the same discipline is required. Number three is what's different. And that's very important for you to understand number three, to know how to partner with these corporate VCs. So venture-like return. I think you've covered that in many different uh, classes from going VC, but we're looking at very large market, Tam and Sam. And of course, we like to see that with a high level of customer pain. Why would this startup bring something really, really valuable in a very, very big market? Uh, so, of course, explosive markets, high barrier to entry. So, we really like companies that uh, can be very sticky and, and very hard to change. Uh, and, of course, we want to have an unfair advantage uh, with this startup. So, something that's very special about them, whether it's a team, whether it's the uh, approach, the technology, something that's really special for them. And, of course, we are looking at returning the fund. So, every single investment we are making, we want to make sure that each investment could actually return the full fund. On sustainability, I think I've mentioned earlier, we really, really care about the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. So every time we look at the startups, the first line of our investment proposal for the investment committee is which SDGs it's, is it going to help? Uh, sustainability, of course, for an end-to-end -end process, very important. Uh, ability to add value to society and prevents uh, adverse outcomes. And the third, which is really specific to a corporate VC, especially in this case, TDK, is it has to fit our long-term strategy. So for example, long-term strategy of TDK is to start to contribute more and more with our sensors, our batteries, and a lot of our technology to medical space. So that means that when we look at a medical company that needs sensors and batteries and all of that, we may want to invest because it fits the strategy. But it has to be a startup that fits the first two criteria before we even get to the strategic fit. Uh, what's nice about corporate VCs is that they have the corporate behind them. So that means that we are going to look for clear-cut synergies with our business units, with our R&D teams. Because if we find this win-win, that's going to really help the startups go faster. And that's going to help us to learn more about these new mountains, these new peaks. And actually, this synergy, we call them um, TDK goodness. And the reason we call them TDK goodness is we want these synergies or, or level of help to be something the startup and the entrepreneur choose to take. We are not going to force any of them. It's a Chinese menu and they choose what they like and what they don't like. Uh, of course, we want to justify we are going to learn about these new mountains beyond the investment. So this is indeed much more than the financial. And very important for financial VCs to partner with us is what is our ability to influence the outcome, to make these startups, because we invest, because we are going to help them, more likely to succeed, more likely to become what we call uh, the winners. And one of our criteria when we look to invest is to search for the king of the hill. So we are looking at which company do we believe are the winners in a small market that's going to have an explosive uh, growth and therefore are more likely to become the king of the mountains. And of course, we want to leverage our deep expertise inside our mother company to build unique insights. What it is that we know that very few people know that makes us believe our investment will be correct. And I'm sure you've gone through that a lot with going VC, but you make really good returns when you're right and most people are wrong. So you need to build these unique insights that not many people know or understand. And you're going to get it wrong from time to time. There is no doubt about it but you need to build this on your conviction about what do you think is going to be the right future. You make your bet on this and hopefully you get the returns because very few people saw it at the time. So let me give you a real world example of an investment we made, which was our first one. And I could speak the same way for all our investments. Um, Starship. So this is a company from Estonia in Europe and the venture like returns is simple. It's a very, very big market potential, very big. And people love convenience and that's not going to go away. Uh, I like Jeff Bezos view on, on uh, where to invest, which is look at what is not going to change. And here people love convenience. And of course the pandemic is simply accelerating this need to have something delivered to you uh, safely and without uh, worry of, um, of the virus. Um, but here, what's interesting is that they found a way with um, robots 
to deliver at a decreasing uh, cost over time. So if you think about delivering uh, goods and services from groceries or from restaurants or from Starbucks, they can do it cheaper than the alternatives and much more safely because you don't have someone driving a bike or a car too fast because they are late. And of course that means better, faster and cheaper. Already, already a really good uh, potential for a financial return. Sustainability is about what I was going to, which is reducing congestions, pollution, it's all electric. Uh, it helps with local charities, so it can actually provide for free deliveries of uh, goods from charities. And it empowers seniors who actually can't easily go to grocery stores. Same for disabled people. And the strategic value for TDK, my mother company, is really about learning more about what type of sensors does this robot need? What type of batteries do they need? Do they need new type of software? Do they need some type of sensor fusion? All of this where TDK has worldwide expertise. Is there something we can help and we can learn from these robots, which we have never seen before? So it's not like we know what they need and we want to understand the solution. So now it gets to a point which is very important and I kind of hinted about it is when you are building a syndicate to have a corporate VC that's going to add value to your startup that you want to invest in is a big advantage. Of course, you need to be very critical about which ones you believe will add value, but I would call it capital plus plus. That's how we call it in, uh, on the website. I like to call it TDK goodness as well. And what that means is in our case, we have one uh, person uh, coming from TDK Tokyo uh, headquarter uh, full time working on all this TDK goodness, customer access that we have with TDK industry connections, market knowledge, channel access, maybe some of our brand equity, or we help them with partnerships. We help them with uh, being a customer for them at, from some of them. We bring some operating expertise. Sometimes we even pay money to help them to accelerate strategic goals. All of that is a Chinese menu. And the entrepreneur, what we want during the kickoff meeting when we start with them is to say, you choose whatever you want. You don't have to choose everything. You choose what you think makes sense for your goals. And when it's done well, it means that we are accelerating their success and reducing risks along the way, which for a financial VC to be in that syndicate is a plus. So, and also what that means is we are really focused on delighting the entrepreneur. And when I say delighting the entrepreneur, I'm not talking about making them happy. I'm talking about making them successful looking at how to make sure that they accelerate their success. And here, this is two of the very nice testimonial we received from them already, but this is going to continue. I have no doubt about it. And one thing that we do, which is very special at TBK Ventures, is we have a net promoter score on the entrepreneur. We are going to ask our entrepreneurs, one to 10, how likely would you recommend us to another entrepreneur? We want to have all the entrepreneurs that we invest in to help them to be more successful and make sure that they want to recommend us to their other entrepreneurs. Now, one of the things that I need to explain because this is important for you to understand the motivation behind a corporate VC uh, is this is about learning about these new mountains. And if you remember this analogy of this helicopter discovering new peaks, this helicopter at some point needs to fly back to bring this information, these learnings, and so what we do at TDK Ventures is we write this, uh, what we call TDK Ventures briefings, where we capture the strategic value. And so far in this um, past 15 months, we have written seven of these TDK Ventures briefing, where we go deep about what we've learned, for example, about diabetes startups landscape, or the implementer, uh, implement, sorry, implantable buy-and sensor, or the EV toll market, vertical takeoff and landing, or the batteries, um, and e-waste recycling landscape. So we are really looking at bringing back this learning, but not as a startup specific, because we don't want to share anything that's specific and confidential from a startup. We want to share what's really interesting about the full landscape. And when we bring that, it means that TDK start to have less clouds between the mountain they are and the peak that we have discovered. And that's really, really the value that we bring. And that means that we are going to invest in companies that we believe are the king of the hill because they are the ones that are going to iterate the first. They are going to have the alpha customer. They are going to pivot. They are going to get the beta customers. 
guess what? These are the customers, these are the startups that are going to help us learn the most about these markets we're not in today with technology we don't have. And so what you can see also is that our, our, our learning start to connect with each other. So all these briefings start to have interdependencies between them. And they, and they uh, of course, address two very important things that matter for TDK, which is DX digital transformation and EX energy transformation. So we're trying to learn really about all the spaces that our mothership wants to learn about. So I'm going to finish with two slides, which is really links that I'm going to share with Rachel afterwards. If you want to learn more about corporate venturing, I'm doing actually an insider series with partnership with 500 Startup, which is one of the biggest accelerator in the world. Really, really good. Uh, I'm going to have one on Thursday this week, which is with the head of the corporate VC of Schneider. Uh, so a really amazing guy. But you can see also I've had already nine of them. So if you want to learn about corporate venturing and what, how they are thinking about, uh, don't hesitate to uh, watch these uh, YouTube videos. They are one hour each and it's very dense of learnings. And the other one, which I didn't want to spend too much time because I don't think it's as relevant for you, but if some of you want to understand more about corporate venturing, this could be very relevant. Uh, I had an interview with Pete Moran, who was a GP at DCM for two decades, really experienced. And I went through all the 50 lessons of me starting a corporate VC inside a Japanese company. And you may not have realized, but I'm not Japanese. And yet I'm the head of um, TDK Ventures and I report directly to the president of TDK. So there was a few lessons which are probably useful if anyone wants to do a corporate VC themselves. So with that, I think I can take uh, questions and I am 25 minutes in like I was predicting. Fantastic, thanks for that presentation, Nicholas. Um, and yeah, I definitely encourage everybody to check out those YouTube videos. I watched the last one and it's a really impressive story of how Nicholas started um, TDK Ventures. We do have a few questions in the chat already. So um, Kelly, would you like to kick us off with your question? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I was just wondering um, when you decide that like for an organization it's better to keep the R&D internal versus, you know, leveraging uh, corporate venture fund versus just buying the company outright entirely for the IP? So it depends on the goal of the corporate VC. So when, when you engage with corporate VC, make sure you understand their motivations. In our case, what we're trying to do is exploration. We are not looking to invest in companies that we would want to acquire in the future. I think out of 12 companies that we have invested today, maybe one of them could become an interesting acquisition. And that's not even a sure thing. It's a maybe depending on which direction they go. Because our purpose is really exploration. It's about learning about markets we're not in today with technology we don't have. But we may actually learn that the company we want to acquire in these new mountains has nothing to do with the companies that we invested in. So it's not true for all corporate VCs. So there are corporate VCs where they actually want to engage early with companies and they will have an m and objective for that. And you can easily uh, identify that by looking at which terms they are trying to negotiate with the startup on their side letters. Are they asking for a first right of refusal for an acquisition? That would give you a very good indication of their true intention. Thank you. Great, and we have another question from Dimitri. Yeah, from a compliance standpoint, what is like TDK's like ownership uh, stake you like look for, for a potential investment? Yeah, that's a good question. So first on the um, ownership level, we actually don't really care uh, because what we're looking is a multiples potential. So what we do every time we are making an investment proposal is we are making a scenario based multiple returns. So we may say the startup there is 40% chance it, the value will get to zero, 20% chance it will be a 0.5x, 20% chance it will be a 1x, 10% 5x, and then we get to a 50x. 
and then we weight it on average and sometimes we get to 3x to 10x. That's basically the range we normally get to. If it's less than 3x, we probably will not invest unless there is really um, a very high beta. So for example, it could be one where it's nearly all or nothing. It could be a 100x or it could be zero. Uh, you could say the companies that we invested called Wheels is probably in that category. They are doing really smart, very safe e-bike solutions, uh, but there is a lot of risk that it's not going to go anywhere and they will be crushed by the competition. But if they are successful, which we believe they could be, then it's a huge potential financial returns. So we are not looking for a special level of ownership. We're looking at if we put $2 million, do we believe this $2 million could become $50 million or more? And if you think about it that way, it doesn't matter whether it's 5% ownership of the company or 1% or 10%. There is, so you were, you were talking about regulatory. So there is one thing which is important to know in the US is that if you invest in a company and you own 10% or more, you are more likely to be under the CFUS regime. And we are not a US company, we're a Japanese company. So we have to be very careful about a level of ownership of 10% or more for US company. If it's outside the US, like Israel or Germany, like we've done, or Estonia or, or um, even China, we don't, we don't worry about this. And we would be very happy to get 15% or 20% ownership. But if it's about US, we would probably want to be at just below 10% or even lower. Great, thanks for that. Um, one, one question I had, so could you tell us a little bit more about um, kind of your investment team makeup and the decision-making process? So you mentioned that you report directly to the president of TDK, which is obviously quite unique to CVCs. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? So one of the advantages I had is that um, I attended the Stanford executive program where we had a professor explaining all the reason why you want to do a corporate VC. And then I had another professor who explained all the reasons corporate VCs fail. <laughs> so it was like, I, I understood why we should do it. And then I understood why we, we should be very careful about how to set it up. And, and one of the statistical um, learning from the best, bad, bad practices was to have the reporting line to be either fuzzy or to the CTO or to the CFO. And it was very important to get a reporting line more to the strategic officer, whether the CEO or the CSO. Uh, so that's a very good question where when you meet with corporate VCs, I think there is value to understand where they report to because their motivation will be very different. Uh, so if, for example, you learn that a corporate VC will report to the CTO, you're going to have investments that are more driven by learning about technology, more about the operation side, but not necessarily about making them successful. So you have to be very careful about this. So this is a very good question. Um, actually, our team is, is small. I think I have um, a picture of it in my um, second slide or third slide. Uh, we made uh, efforts to make sure this was diverse. And when I say diverse, there are many ways to say it, but there is also the, the element of, I was looking for people who were not from TDK. So we, we had a startup liaison who was from TDK because he needs to understand all the different business group in the company. But I was also looking for two investment directors who actually are not from the corporate VC. I didn't want to have anyone who came with a prejudged view about how corporate VC could be. I wanted to make sure we started with best practices from the beginning. And so maybe it's, it, it's encouraging for your audience, but uh, we were actually looking for people who had a very different background and they would bring um, uh, something new to the mix. And the way I like to think about decision making is if you have three people who always agree with them, you only have the value of one brain. But even if you have three people who are thinking very differently, you have three brains. And I like to think that the three brains would be much smarter uh, to think about all the reasons to invest and not to invest than a single brain. So when I recruited Andrew and Anil, my two investment directors, I looked at them because I knew they were thinking differently from me and they were thinking differently from each other. Now, on the decision making, I think one thing that I made by design is that I do not have, I do not have a veto right. So as long as my investment directors are well-researched, 
they have uh, conviction, they have good explanation why this um, uh, company and the startup could be very successful, I will not veto it. They can go ahead with the investment proposal. And the reason is, it's back to what I was saying earlier, you need to be right when most people are wrong. And that starts with your own team. I could be wrong and I don't want Anil, for example, to be right about something and I don't believe it and we don't invest. He will probably get it wrong many times, but the few times he will be right when all of us are wrong, that's when we return the fund and more. Really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one more question that I think would be interesting for the group, and you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. I think it was the slide uh, titled Capital Plus Plus, but really kind of the um, value adds that you bring to your portfolio companies. Um, would you be able to share maybe a few examples of, of what that looks like? Very good. So let me put back this uh, screen first. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So first I can tell you, apart from the title I changed for you guys, uh, this is a slide I show to all our potential um, uh, startups, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, VCs. And I don't know if you can see the picture at the back, uh, but you can see me in the middle being very happy and surrounded by people in suits and, and so on. And that was the first day of my company being acquired by TDK. And you can see balloons and pay, pay, people being very happy. And my message was, I hope that any startup that join the TDK Ventures portfolio will feel the same. They feel very welcome and they feel like we're going to help them be very successful. And, and so, and that's why I like to say it's a Chinese menu because uh, we really want any of these uh, different um, uh, bullet points to be something they can decide to take or not to take and to suggest others. So let me talk about something that's not listed as an example. Uh, we invested in Autoflight. So if you look uh, behind me, it would be this eVTOL, Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft. I went to Brazil with the CEO of Autoflight and we met with the equivalent of the FAA uh, to make sure that they knew that we were serious and we would continue to invest in the company. And, and, and therefore Autoflight was here for a long time. And then we went to see one of the biggest uh, government agencies that are looking at uh, power lines and they needed a service like uh, auto flight to be able to identify where the lines start to get too close to the tree so that they can cut the tree and to avoid fires and today they use helicopter which is very expensive not very easy to do while this uh, aircraft that comes from auto flight can do it very quickly so that's an example where we really helped uh, auto flight to get into the brazilian market but sometimes it's about introducing a startups to other VCs that we believe would be interested for the next round. And that's good for the startup to be able to know that they will have other VCs to be able to lead the next round. But it's also good for us to learn about what the other VCs wants to invest in or not. Uh, sometimes we, we introduce them to potential customers and some of them are winning customers after our introductions. Uh, sometimes it's about inviting them to um, to a show. So for example, CES is one of these biggest show in the world in Las Vegas every January, including this year, we, I went. And what we did is we had this big booth at TDK where we display all our technology and all our products. And we allocated a very premium space in a premium part of the um, CES event for um, Starship. So Starship is this little robot and they were there and they got a lot of, um, journalists coming and the press coming and potential customer coming, uh, asking questions. So that's the kind of thing that we're always trying to brainstorm is how can we help them? And of course the obvious, which is nearly we do for all of them and they all want it, is our access to our technology, access to our products, access to our uh, worldwide experts. All of them really want that. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a few more questions that have come in through the chat. Kelly, it looks like you have a question. Let me see all of my questions. Okay, yeah. 
Um, who do you uh, usually co-invest with? And do you ever co-invest with other CBC? Um, because, you know, that's another corporation. Maybe there's yep, yeah. So yes, sometimes we invest with other corporate VCs. So like uh, Intel Capital or Applied Materials, Applied Ventures. Um, we do that when we think that what they are going to bring to the startup is the same goal, which is to accelerate their success and reduce the risks. So we, we like to introduce other corporate VCs when we think it's synergistic with what the startup's mission is about. What we are not going to do is to look at a corporate VC who is not able to help the startup as a plus. In this case, it's not a plus. Um, but we also want to work with uh, financial VCs. And I would say that if a syndicate is only made of financial VCs, it's probably okay. If a syndicate is only corporate VCs, it's probably not okay. Because you want to have at least one or two financial VCs who are really going to be looking at the financial returns. From a point of view of, this is the only thing they really care, is to make sure that all the returns have a venture type returns. And when you have corporate VCs, it's very easy for many of them to start looking at the strategic element and to say, okay, it's so strategic, we don't need the financial returns. And in our case, like I mentioned, we want a financial return. So to have a financial VC in the syndicate is helping us to validate that it's not just us believing it would be a good financial return, but others can also believe it. Oh, thank you. Let's see, um, Fez has our next question. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Hi, Nicola. Thanks for the insights on partnering with uh, financial VCs, partnering with corporate VCs. One question that I had is, how do you manage your deal flow? Do you go out in the market? Do you go out to labs who are in the tech space? Or do you partner with say, financial VCs to get a better deal flow coming in? It's, it's very diverse. Um, what I'm actually really pleased with is, as of today, we reach 1,200 deal flow uh, for 12 investments. So we are in this very healthy 1% of deal flow to investments. Uh, to be honest, it's not, it's probably what we call a vanity KPI. I don't think it really matters to be at this 1%, but I think it's a good uh, healthy ratio to look at. You don't want to get to a point where 10% of all your deal flow becomes investment. I think that was probably not a good discipline. Um, we, we try to, so first we have the incoming and the incoming could come from partners. So for the first six months of starting TDK Ventures, we probably contacted 140 plus VCs and CVCs and universities and accelerators, trying to tell them what we can bring to the startups. So I wouldn't be surprised that half of our deal flow came from this outreach, where we explained what we could add value to the startups and being very consistent after that on delivering on it and making sure that they knew about our progress over time. Uh, quite a good proportion of deal flow, and maybe it's 100 or 200 of them, uh, comes from TDK employees recommending startups that they meet. I haven't mentioned it, but TDK is 105,000 employees. Uh, it's highly technical, so we have a chance to meet with really good companies before everyone else can see them. And because we are making clear to everyone in TDK that they can recommend um, companies, we are getting a nice deal flow from that. And then what's happening is, remember I said that we are looking for king of the hill. Well, that means that when we do our due diligence, we spend a lot of time to make sure they are the king of the hill, which means that when we look at one startup we are, we've been recommended, we start to look at probably at 30 or 40 other companies, and we probably talk to at least five or 10 of them that feel the most promising to decide who is the king of the hill. And of course, that becomes a deal flow in itself. So I would say our due diligence is probably a, a one third of all our deal flow is that this is us approaching them and trying to identify if they are the king of the hill versus the one that was coming to us. And I think, I think more than half of the time we find the king of the hill is not the one that approached us, but the one that we find afterwards by just reaching out. And the way we reach out is very different. We can look at pitch book, we look at different database, we go on the websites, we search online, 
That's why I think some of you who wants to be associate or analyst is really cool because you get a chance to really learn a lot about a space and to identify who you think is going to be that king of the hill. And once we have that, we can really go back to our investment committee and to say, we have looked at so many companies and this is that one that really matters. This is the one that is most likely to win and to pivot first and to get the better customers, which means more strategic value and more financial returns. Thank you. Great, um, Dimitri has another question. Sure, I want to talk more about the fundraising process for like a corporate VC, because I know you have different strategic, you can do like M&A and you can have also invest in your core business. So how's like the allocation process to get capital for like your fund? So in our case, it's purely exploration. So it's 100% about learning about new spaces. So we don't have um, an allocation for um, M&A. That, that's actually a different team inside TVK. Um, what I can say is uh, we were planning to have 40% of our fund as reserve for follow investments. And when COVID-19 started, we felt like we needed to make sure we stand by our portfolio companies even more so. So we decided to increase our reserve to 50%. So in terms of allocation, we have no allocation like you're thinking about, which is between uh, m and or not, but we do have an allocation for follow investments. And so for the startups we believe will be needing us and will be successful, then we actually have a big chunk of our fund to help them and to make sure that they will continue to be funded. So I'm not sure I've answered your question, so tell me if not but we don't have an allocation otherwise. Seems like the bulk is for like follow-up investments after you find the right startups initially. Exactly, so the 12 companies that we have invested in, I think we will probably invest in three more with a fund. And then we have 25 million of our 50 million, which is going to be allocated to uh, follow investment on this 15. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, it looks like Jocelyn, you have a question um, about the investment team. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I have worked on a consultancy and I've worked with CVCs uh, like Chevron Technology Ventures and the team competition was, since it's oil and gas, it was highly technical and there were all previous, most of them engineering. Um, so for, for uh, TDK, what is the team composition? I know you said that you didn't want people that were previously working at TDK, but what about like an engineer background, a technology background, or a finance background? What was the, a particular interest area? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So I'll start with our startup liaison, his uh, financial background, accounting background in the past, so he doesn't have an engineering background, yet he's the one who tried to understand how the technology is going to be helping different teams inside TDK and how different teams inside TDK can help the startup. So in a way, not having an engineering background for him probably means that he has to ask the questions to a point where it starts to make sense. So he has to simplify. And that means the entrepreneurs have to really make an effort to simplify things. And that's a skill for the entrepreneurs that we look for. Uh, our two investment directors have a technical background. One has a PhD and one uh, an engineering background. So definitely something that we needed for the investment director. Uh, and the reason is all our investments are technology driven and, and some of them are really hard tech. Um, if I look at how we're going to grow the team, I think in January or February, uh, which is going to be two associates and probably one more investment director and a project manager. Of course, a project manager doesn't need to be technical. Uh, and the project manager is going to be driving all the um, uh, different connections between our portfolio companies and the various teams inside TVK, making sure we follow through our commitment. And if you think about it today, we have 12 portfolio company it's about 40 different engagements because one portfolio, one portfolio company wants to engage with multiple teams inside TDK. As we start to go into our fund number two and we start to have maybe 40 investment that becomes 200 little projects to follow through. So I think project manager doesn't need to be uh, technical but definitely needs to understand the technology enough to know where is the value. 
the two as analysts we are going to look at or associates, I think they don't need to be um, an engineering background, but they need to love technology. They need to feel that technology is really going to help contributing to society and is going to help uh, in a massive way and, and understand why. And then uh, as the overlay is also about diversity of thought. So uh, looking for people who are thinking differently from the team that we already have. Thank you. This is a very good explanation. Thank you. Great. Um, Arun has our next question. Hey guys, uh, Nicholas, just wanted to open up with, with just uh, a word of thanks. This has been, this has been really, really helpful. I think, I don't know, at least speaking for myself, I've learned a lot and uh, it's really great to hear someone kind of communicate uh, around the CBC world with such thought and, and in such a compelling way. Um, my, my question was actually pertaining to, to something you, you already talked a little bit about, which was, I think, the, the surfer um, who has a certain line of sight. And then, you know, in an organization, there's, there are other teams kind of focusing on uh, new customers or, or expanding beyond certain competencies. And, and I think, like, the classic M&A investment team. Yes, this is the one. Yeah, the, the M&A investment team kind of came up here. And my question was going to be around you know, at bigger organizations that, that may be maybe entrenched with, with their M&A teams and they've got deal teams and they have their own processes and things like that. Do you have a sense of like how, how to create the value prop for a CVC team or, or, or how to very clearly create separation between these teams? Because it, it's, it, it feels like it, it might be a challenge in some organizations. So I was hoping you could speak uh, to that. Well, first, I think you're pointing the finger where it hurts. <laughs> so... <laughs> No, 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 it doesn't hurt for me, uh, yeah. but it hurts probably for many corporate VC trying to get started. And even as they get started, they start to have tension where it doesn't make sense to have tension. Uh, for some reason, uh, I mean, like I said, I, was, I joined TDK probably a year earlier. They acquired my company. Um, I didn't have any network except that I was working a lot with the senior management because I was in charge of Qualcomm, which was the biggest partner of TDK. So I had an opportunity to meet with the top management and they knew what I could deliver. So I think there was a level of trust and confidence. But back to your question about the m &A team, this slide was extremely important for me to show to get the TDK Ventures approved. And the reason is it could show where the m &A team was responsible for and what TDK Ventures would be responsible for. And you would think it's a very simple quadrant and this is very straightforward, but it's not. And that's why you have this dotted line. There's a reason the dotted line is there, is that it's always a little fuzzy. It's very clear that corporate R&D and M&A in TDK and most companies, they're responsible to look at how to expand the market, uh, customer access, channel access with the current products. Or they're looking at, okay, we have these uh, automotive customers and we have this type of product, what other products we could we acquire from a company to serve our existing customers? So it's very obvious that they will do that. It's very hard for an m and team to go onto the other quadrant, but it happens. And that's why you can still see it close to the core. You can see it's here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Yeah, okay. So you still have m and that will do it, but it has to be still close to the business unit guy. It has to be quite close to the core. And what we were saying in TDK Ventures when I was proposing is to say, we're going to be quite outside the core. We're going to look at things that we believe we will get there in five years, not next year. And so what that means is we were very clear about where we are going to contribute, but also where we are going to be playing versus m and team and corporate R&D. And then if you remember, I had the other slides um, with the two bullets, this one, this slide was very important to show the overlap that exists, but also the very different goals between corporate development, which is the m and team in, in the case of TDK, and the corporate VC. So you, you're asking a very good question, Arun, because when you are looking at teams that are entrenched, uh, you have to understand their motivation and what they care about. And if you're proposing a project that's uh, good and, and that will help the company, make sure you explain how it, it, it positioned. And this slide I'm showing you right now is a slide that I was showing to the CEO of TDK the very first time 
I got access to him to present the project. So I'm actually showing you exactly the slide I presented to the CEO of TDK. And at the end of that presentation, he basically said, that's exactly what I want. And what's, what's pretty amazing about this is TDK is a company that's 85 years old and never had a corporate VC. While so many Japanese companies had corporate VCs because they were doing what others were doing. TDK doesn't think that way. They're not thinking if others do it, I have to do it. That's not how they think. They only do something when it makes sense. And for some reason, when I presented that, when I presented the wave uh, slide, it's exactly what he was looking for for corporate VC. That's, that's super helpful. And, and maybe just the, the one follow up here is when, when you managed to, to get this off the ground, how did you work with the M&A team to make it seem like you weren't taking food off their plate, even if it was opportunistic food, as you said, that little, that, that triangle that, that does exist. But I don't know that, that this would also, obviously it brings value to TDK. Did you have to communicate that it also brought value to them through having so, these capabilities? I, so I think that's where you will enjoy watching the company, the, sorry, the videos that I did about starting a CVC. Because I keep saying it's about the why. Be very clear about the why and be consistent about the why and make sure the message stays on the why. And so, for example, when uh, we, we had started for three months, I think, and TDK looked at making a minority equity investment into a company, a gas sensing company. And many people came to me and say, why are you not looking after it? And I basically said, that's not for TDK Ventures. This is really a core uh, call to, uh, to the company. This is core to the business group. That's what the business group wants to do. It has to be the M&A team. This is what they should be doing. So I reinforced this separation between M&A team and us. I didn't try to take what's not mine. I was making it clear, but also I spent time to explain why it was not for us. And, and uh, two months ago, we had a business group that was looking at acquire, um, investing in a hacking company. And they came to us saying, is that something you want to do? And I said, well, no, this is actually you. It should be you. I'm very happy to help you with the due diligence. I'm very happy to help you with access to our tools, to the way we are thinking about investment, financial, and so on. But this is your decision, and this is on your PL. And so we are basically the friendly that helps them to think about how to raise a bar in terms of making the right investment and for the right reasons. But we're not taking what's not ours for, for us. So there is a lot of um, 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 pitfalls you need to be careful about, but if you stay consistent about the why and you keep repeating the why, the messaging about, in our case, exploration and these new peaks, and I keep using that inside CDK even after two years, uh, you're going to end up people understanding exactly where you add value versus not. Got it. Yeah, the consistency is, is really the, the word that popped out there. And, and, and more broadly, just really, really appreciate your, your time here. This has been super helpful. Thank you. Fantastic. So we just have a few minutes left till the end of the hour. Um, and we had one more question come in um, from Sean, if you would like to ask that. Uh, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I know I know the arm is quite new, but out of curiosity, what would happen if one of your competitors uh, acquired one of your port codes down the road? Would you get upset? Would you, you know, flip the table? What would you do? Well, if it's a 50x return, I would be very happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw the party on the slide earlier. Everyone would get another party, right? <laughs> no, but to be honest, any of our companies, if they, if they find a good home and it's a good financial returns, we will get a lot of value, a lot of value. Because any good exit is going to actually be really, really good for us. Uh, like I said, out of 12 companies, uh, 11 of them are clearly not an M&A target for us, so they're obvious. And one that might become, if it's acquired by competitors, then it's okay, because this is about us being best practice. What would happen is, of course, if I learn that they are being approached by a competitor, I'll check with my management saying, guys, are you interested? Because at the end, even if it's TDK buying it at a good premium, it will still be good for my financial returns. So I, I actually don't mind that the, my company and my competitors start to bid over it. It will be good for me. So at the end of the day, we're not doing this for an M&A um, goal, but if it was our goal, then I would probably respond very differently. 
but because our goal is really about exploration and learning, uh, I can even make the point that I showed you this TDK Ventures briefing, which is about capturing learnings that we have done during, we have captured during the due diligence, right? Some of them came from a space we have done a due diligence, we learned a lot, we captured these learnings and we did this briefing, but we decided not to invest because we didn't like the space enough. Or uh, we decided it's not quite ready for us to invest, but we learned a lot, so we share these learnings. And some of them was where we invested. So I, I can actually easily argue that we bring value already even when the company gets acquired by someone else. All right, thank you. Fantastic. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with our group tonight. Just to echo Arun's comments, I think it's been really insightful and gives our members a much better understanding of corporate venture capital. Um, I will share the slides with everybody as well as the recording. Um, and also I'll be sure to share the webinar series that Nicholas um, suggested especially the one on um, starting a corporate venture capital firm. It's super insightful. So again, Nicholas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Bye.